Thank you all. Uh, good evening. It's very really exciting to be here today. Uh, my name, as it says in the slide, is Siddharth Pai. I'm a product manager at Google. Uh, I consider myself fortunate that I've had a chance to work in product management for over 10 years in two large, uh, pretty exciting tech companies. And I'm here today to share with you what I know and what I can share from my own experiences around how to be a versatile product manager. I'll go a little bit more into my background and the specific type of products I've worked on in a few slides. But I thought I'd start off by first just you know, making sure we are all on the same page as to what does it mean to be a versatile PM. As I was chatting with a couple of you before the talk started, the term versatility can mean quite a few different things. Um, so let's get crisp on which aspects I want to cover over the next hour or so. And uh, to do that, I realize it's after 6.30 on a Thursday evening. So first of all, thank you for coming out. Um, the weekend is coming up. So I thought I'd get us warmed up by making a couple of quick movie references as we start approaching the subject. So the first one um, is this movie. It's called American Sniper. Uh, came out a few years back. The interesting thing is uh, Bradley Cooper plays the role of a US Navy SEAL. And the movie goes into quite a few different things, um, how he ends up getting selected as a Navy SEAL. When he goes out tours of duty, he's essentially parachuted in to a variety of situations and ends up being very successful, becomes a war hero. The plot explores a few other things as to what happens when he comes back to the mainland in between those tours of duty. But the part that I wanted to focus on was that aspect of a Navy SEAL, where you're so well trained that when you go and are dropped into a situation, Regardless of what the environment is, what is the task at hand, you can be effective from the get-go. And that's the aspect of versatility which I want to touch upon today, is as you guys express your interest in product management and want to go and be successful product managers, regardless of what type of product it is that you're working on, can you go ahead and hit the ground running, quickly get up to speed as to who's the users, what is the core value prop of the product, and start working with your target customer base and your audience to go ahead and be very effective in that role. So I'm not promising that by the end of the hour, we'll all be able to start in the next Clint Eastwood movie, but I'm hoping uh, that I can share enough that you leave with a good understanding of what are the different type of things that go into different types of products and be effective in your own ways. All right, so let's jump in. Um, why should we care about being versatile? Uh, in fact, there was an interesting question from uh, one of you in the audience, which was, as you look at the roles, do you think about it being more as a generalist PM or a specialist PM? And what are some pros and cons and what choices do people make? Uh, I believe to a large extent it ends up being a very personal choice. There's PMs who end up liking to specialize in a specific area and are good at it, enjoy going deep, and continue to do that for a number of years. But even if that's what we choose to do, I believe it's very important to learn to be versatile and to be able to adapt for a few different reasons. Um, one is if you take a look at which type of organizations typically hire product managers. Um, you can think about either the very large companies. <coughs> and large organizations often like to hire generalist product managers, which is folks who can be working in a specific product area for a number of years. And at a later point of time in their careers, if they were interested, go to a completely different product area and still be successful and effective in that other space. So that's one aspect. The second reason is, uh, if you look at startups, now personally, I've only worked in large tech companies, so I lean on somebody who's actually very well versed in the space of startups. I don't know if many of you have heard of Steve Black. Um, he was recognized by Forbes magazine, I'm seeing a few heads nodding, as being one of the 30 most influential people in tech, um, I think in the year 2030. And he's actually done quite a few startups himself. I believe at this point, he's a consulting associate professor at Stanford and talks about entrepreneurship. So what he says is, in his opinion, startups are organizations that are in search of a scalable and long-standing, repeatable business model. Now, when you reflect on that, it actually does make sense that then it's not unusual to find that a startup goes ahead and starts approaching a specific product direction, starts building more on that, and then realizes that they need to pivot to a completely different type of product in order to be effective at what they are trying to do. So you'll hear of cases where somebody or a particular company starts off as a B2C, B2C company and then realizes a few months into their discovery process, we're actually more effective being a B2B product. And maybe shift at that point to becoming an enterprise product. Now, so if you think about you know, these different types of organizations, 
and the fact that even once you start working as a PM, these shifts can come, sometimes outside of your control. It's therefore important to be able to quickly adapt to the situation. The other thing is your product strategy often evolves. Uh, so a lot of the time you think you're going to go ahead and have a hypothesis. This is the need. This is the type of product I'm going to build. This is my minimum set. I go release it and watch for feedback. <coughs> then you realize that inevitably, even like I make mistakes all the time, you realize, wait, these things were not right. Or, oh, we thought it would work this way, but it turns out that this particular demographic has a different preference. And then you are having to shift after your product is on its way, after you already are a PM in that role. The last bit is technology evolves. We're here today on a October evening in 2017. Let's go back 10 years. The year 2007 was the first time that the iPhone was announced. Now imagine a world a couple of years before that, and imagine the world five years later and today, and just think about the number of product managers who needed to work on or wanted to work on mobile or rich smartphone apps or tablet apps. And this was a very large technological shift. There were many other companies and things in play, but this happens all the time. Um, some of you mentioned you work in the enterprise. So if you look at what's happening in the enterprises space, um, I believe it was 2013 when Docker containers were first announced. Kubernetes, a really popular container orchestration service, came out only in the year 2015. In a span of five years, large parts of how you would go about building excuse me, your own <clears throat> enterprise product from scratch today have changed drastically. So these are just a few examples of where technology changes really quickly. And I therefore believe it's important to be able to adapt and be versatile. And the last reason, which I didn't put on the slide, is actually you all evolve. So let's do something uh, interesting for a second. Imagine it's your most amazing day. You are the product manager for whichever product, for whichever company you most admire. And let's say you're walking to your first day of work, super excited. Now raise your hands, everyone, for a minute, and then start dropping them as it no longer applies. Let's go ahead and do it. Do you expect that you would enjoy working on that product six months from now? How about two years from now? Five years from now, would you want to work on the same product? And hands are starting to come down. The point is your own interests, your own preferences change over time. And therefore, being more sky adds another dimension. So let's move forward. Why do I believe I can help uh, with this conversation today? So some of you were mentioning you were interested in my sort of own career, my own journey being a BM in the industry. Uh, I started off as a computer science grad, really enjoyed working on hard technical um, problems. In fact, as I was chatting with one of you, as I entered the program, I honestly didn't even know there was a role called as product management. Little that it would interest me so quickly. Um, I ended up starting off as a BM intern at Microsoft. That turned out to be a pretty interesting experience. Uh, loved what I was doing. The team was happy to have me. And I went back and joined full time, working in the Microsoft identity division. Um, I don't know if several of you who are in the enterprise space may have heard of a product called Active Directory. It's very widely deployed on-premises in a lot of large companies. And that was a product team that I worked on for a number of years. Um, and so as a part of that, there were some very interesting uh, situations that I found myself in. So one is, you guys, by the way, I'm just sensing already are a very exciting and lovely audience. Thank you. There are times when I found myself in a room full of CISOs, CIOs uh, trying to defend our latest security offering while they are, as they should, scrutinizing it very deeply. Um, a presentation like this might not be met back with so many smiles that I'm seeing right now, but rather, wait, does this really work? Or how can you prove it? Or has somebody actually audited it and can prove that this thing you're telling me is correct? And a variety of situations like that. Um, pretty good learning experience. I did that for a few years. And then I shifted gears to working on consumer apps. Um, I ended up starting off with a desktop or a tablet type app. Then we took it to the mobile form factor. And we took it to different operating systems. And the idea was that we then also ended up connecting the entire experience that you had when you ended up at our site, either through a web browser, or through a mobile app, or a tablet app, or any of the properties. And you got a nice cohesive experience. So that was a very different set of challenges. You're trying to make UX, which is very rich and compelling. You're trying to get users to, of course, continue to be able to do whatever they wanted to do while still trying to engage them and retain their interest. And doing this when there's a variety of other things that they're interested in, like in the whole ecosystem. So it was a very uh, unique experience. And then for my third challenge, uh, I joined Google and I worked in the Google Ads organization. Uh, and as a part of this role, I worked on a CRM and sales intelligence product. 
Um, and this was a very, very different experience too because now the set of folks who I was chatting with, who I was interested in having taken active interest in my features, were very senior business executives. And it's important to be able to demonstrate, first identify and then demonstrate the value of the products and features to them, to that audience. And I'll talk more about some strategies and things to try if you find yourself working in this space. Um, so as a result of you know, these three different products that I've worked on, I ended up working for over a decade. And as a product school reached out and wanted to have this talk today, I reflected on a few things that I learned, uh, things that I've liked, which helped me be effective, some mistakes that I made, and what did I learn from those. And that's what I'm here to share with you all. All right, uh, let's continue. So before we jump in and start saying, here's what's different, let's take a look at what's common. What, in my opinion, does not change as we look at building our products, no matter what type of product it is. So I'll go back to the second movie reference. I said I'll you know, warm us up in a few minutes, and then we'll start digging in deeper. I wanted to show you this particular movie, which is called Dangal. The actor that you're seeing on screen is Amir Khan. He is a very famous Bollywood actor. And the interesting thing about this movie is it actually shows the life of an athlete. When he was an athlete, and then many years later, when he was a parent and had two teenage daughters who he was trying to motivate to go into the same sport that he was very effective at. As a part of that sort of interest is, so as a result of that, during the course of the movie, the actor ended up playing both the young budding athlete and the dad who after some years had put on a few pounds and looked quite different. But the interesting thing is, he went ahead and decided to not use any of the padding or like cushioning and he actually chose to put on about 55 pounds to do the other role, lose them all the way back. I'm not saying to be a great product manager, you know, we need to go and be like the weight loss masters, biggest loser or whatnot. Uh, but the very interesting thing is he went through this whole experience. He in fact jokes in an interview that I made sure I did this particular role first, so that it wouldn't just be me, but the entire production unit, which made sure I lost weight again and went back to my original form. Uh, that's the first example. There's one more. Uh, let's take a look at this actor. How many of you have seen House of Cards? Yes, I see many hands go up. I will admit, that is when I first came across his work as Remy Dalton on the House of Cards. Um, his name is Marishala Ali. What I did not know until I was reading another interview by him is he was actually doing three different roles at the same time, working very hard, seven days a week. And the challenge as an actor is, how do you go ahead and transform, <coughs> excuse me, go across these different roles without getting them mixed up in your head? And so he had a very interesting thing that he did. He says he took the time to go ahead and build out three playlists. And before he went out to the set, or when he was in his trailer, he would actually listen to that particular playlist to get his mind into the form of the role that he was going to play, and he'd then go out. Uh, that was another very interesting day. Give me a moment. The third story I'll share is actually my own. Um, this goes back many years. I was in high school. We all like to try different things. Fortunately, I did not try too many other crazy things, but I did decide to dabble in acting a little bit. So I go to our high school's annual night, and I was about, I think, 15 or so years old, playing the role of a 60-year-old man. And we had the final dress rehearsal before the actual performance. So I memorized all the lines, gone ahead, and you know, made sure I set them on stage without fumbling with too many of them. And the curtains were down, we were to come back the next day. But as I was walking back backstage, true story, somehow in my gut I felt like, you know, that, that wasn't as powerful as I think it could have been. So I decided to walk up to our dramatics teacher, she was a wonderful lady, encouraged us to try out various kinds of things, was very active in environment and whatnot. And so she tells me one thing, she says, you know what, you're done, go home and get some rest. But I'll share with you that when you come back tomorrow, in your mind, come back thinking that you are that 60-year-old man. So I went back, slept, came in the next day, literally imagining, like intentionally, jokingly with my friends, you know, stumbling a bit with my cane and whatnot. While I was backstage, before I went on, I was actually, in my mind, pretending to be an old man. It was an interesting experience. I went in, was, at least for me, a pretty powerful performance. The school recognized me with some award and certificates and whatnot. But the point was, I was very happy for having tried out her advice. Now by this time I'm thinking, all of these stories are great, 
But why are we here talking about acting so much? But the thing is, it's not about the acting. It's about the character. In fact, it is about putting yourself in the shoes of your character. And as you guys think about our products, the character is your end user. Let me share why do I pick up on this. Many of you have probably heard about this term user empathy several times in different contexts. But I'll share that this is the one that I chose to go into today for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is, as several of you mentioned, you are currently not in product management, looking to transition in. <clears throat> I'm glad I've had the opportunity to speak with a few other folks who are in that situation and work through them and try and help them in my little way. And one of the things that I found was pretty interesting. A lot of folks who are not in product management are obviously very effective in whatever else they're doing right now. Very smart, very talented. Take the time to read and invest and learn about the role, learn about what it takes. But here's what I find. So after a few minutes into a conversation like you know one which you might have one on one if I was chatting with you, we'd get to a point where we'd say, okay, now let's take a look and see how would you productize this. And at that point, I'd find that as they were approaching the question or they were structuring their answers, they had the frameworks and the templates down pat. Like they knew this is the framework, this is how you apply it. I read it and somebody joked about a you know coding interview or a PM interview book. I've read here, I know how to apply it. Great. Start talking them about metrics. Oh, these are the AARP metrics, these are the pirate metrics. I've seen this presentation. They have the down pat too. I asked them, one of them, all right, go ahead and describe for me, you know, what would be the MVP that you would propose? So MVP, as many of you probably know, is minimum viable product. Looks at me and goes, I'll tell you the LMLP. I said, okay, what's MLP? This is the most lovable product. My MVP V1 is going to be amazing. Okay. But then as they started sharing, it came across as a distinct, incoherent set of features that were coming together and not actually solving the user's problem. Now, if you think about it, take a step back. These folks who I was having conversations with are smart, they're intelligent, they get how to apply the frameworks. They probably knew more metrics than I do off the top of my head, to be honest. But I believe they could have been that much more effective if they started thinking from the lens of what is the user, what are they trying to do, what problem are I solving, and then they apply the metrics, the frameworks, the templates to their thoughts. And so if you take one thing away, and I do believe honestly it is, common does not change based on which type of product you're working on, is to think about the user, think about what matters to them, and then move forward. It's actually a it might seem like I have this on the slide and I've been talking about interviews, but even today when there's times that I'm trying to prioritize between, all right, I could go and build these three features, or wait, that's the one that's 80% done, but I ran into this issue, how do I prioritize? Well, that has a dependency, it'll take a couple extra quarters, should I wait, should I go to market with like a different feature? Going ahead and leading in with this principle really helps address a lot of the dynamics. So start with this and see if that helps you. That's been one thing that definitely has helped me. Question. You talk about the, your acting career and putting yourself in the, you know, the 60-year-old's mind. You talked about also um, really putting yourself, giving empathy to the user. Now, I've always found that actually spending that time with the user, putting your feet in their shoes, sitting with them side by side, and, and understanding their problems from a real-time basis is is often the best way to get done. Yeah, great, great comment then. Like that approaches this broader subject of how do you go ahead and put yourself in the shoes of your users? One thing I will say, just a second, I'll get to you is, by the way, my acting career, thank you for being so kind. It was all of two performances long, one probably in the 10th grade, the other one in 12th, and then I took a very different engineering uh, oriented path. But that said, like I think your meta point as valid is, what are some ways that you can do it? There's a variety of different strategies. Um, one that you started with is very effective for certain types of products. Actually, in general, no matter which product, you probably can't go wrong going and observing your users for a certain amount of time. And getting a good sense, especially if the target user is not who, one that you're typically well versed with. Like if you were to design a product for somebody such as yourselves, you'd have naturally a very nice and intuitive understanding of what they'd probably expect. But if you quickly shifted the conversation to you are saving to design a product for some folks who are living in Africa, who are about 12 years old, and who have never ever actually worked on the internet, and say some other things that are unique to them, live in a very hilly terrain, like just add a few dimensions. And then it might be much harder intuitively to know what they want. Going ahead and actually observing them is definitely a good strategy. 
Beyond that, there's a few other things you can do based on the type of product and how much you need to scale. What wide of a user demographic are you targeting? There's things like partnering with, if you're in a large organization, your UX research team, who can be, an, who can be a fantastic ally. Even doing simple things, like if you have a product that has a product forum, go ahead and actually take the time to read several forum replies yourself. You probably have a support partner who's gonna go ahead and distill and tell you, here were the six like biggest issues, these are the ones that are coming up the most, these are the three that the biggest customers are blocked on, but actually investing the time and going ahead and reading several of those yourselves will give you a very different perspective. You had a question? Uh, I guess it's a bit easier to kind of trying to go into the mindset of user when you're in the kind of consumer uh, product, right? When you're making a product for corporate, like Active Directory, who, who is the user? CEO, CDO, the poor guy with computer who's licking the buttons? Yeah, that's actually a very interesting point. If you wouldn't mind me tabling that since I have a slide to cover exactly that in a few moments, but we'll come back to it, is that, and the comment for the whole room was, it does get tricky, especially when you talk about non-consumer products, because there may be more than one road that's involved. So I'll share some couple of examples of when that actually happens in a couple of slides. Okay, so let's keep moving forward um, and talk about from, like, here's the part that was common to the very different challenges that come in if you start focusing at or thinking about different types of products. To go ahead and do that, um, just to start us off with grounding us on your terminology. This isn't any formal classification that you might find in a textbook. It's one that's more for convenience and for structuring the rest of our conversation today. There's three buckets that I go ahead and split things into. One is the enterprise product. Um, this may, for instance, typically be or a lot of times be infrastructure or deployment oriented. Consumer product, which several of us or most of us are innately familiar with because they're probably using many consumer products every day. Typically, or most often I should say, taking the form of apps or websites or things like that. And the third one is uh, business products, which may be certain things that actually exist to advance the function of the business. So Salesforce, CRM is a great example. Certain types of finance software like say accounting is another example of the type of business product. A lot of the time you'll find that folks typically tend to bundle the first and the third categories, and you certainly can, there are several similarities. But I just broke them out as separate because I think there's a few special strategies you can try if you're in this bucket versus the first one. And I'll share what those are. Okay. So let's jump in and let's start talking about enterprise products. Now enterprise products, in my opinion, and none of this is an exact science, and there's obviously some simplifications. So if there's parts that don't resonate with you, then, and we'll have time for Q&A at the end, let's definitely come back and explore. But essentially, it exists to solve a problem that is key to the customer's heart. And the problem could take various forms. The industries could be very different, depending on which customer or organization are you talking about. But at the end of the day, that is often the core of where an enterprise product originates from. And they can start getting more complex. They can start evolving um, in various ways. So what are some key characteristics? Um, and I don't obviously try and cover everything. I just try to include bits which I thought were relevant as you were thinking about it as a product manager. And one of the key things that comes in an enterprise product is actually getting it in the hands of the users at that particular customer. And there's two large, obviously it's a simplification, but ways that you can think about it. One is on-premises, or when the customer self-deploys and self-manages your product. If you go back many years, and even today in a lot of organizations, managing things in their own data center, which they deploy, their IT or their development teams deploy, and actually manage, would be sort of the first bucket. The second is this more recent trend, and it's recent as in it's been a few years, but it has been accelerating off late, is the software as a service model or a cloud deployment model. In which case, the key difference is, if you are the team or the company that's building the product, you actually manage the software, the hardware that it runs on, and you make it available to your customers as a service. And then they could go ahead and connect to it. You might still have some storage space for them to be able to store, store the right types of things, various other functions around it. But the key thing is you yourselves are responsible for managing. And the reason that um, you, some of you might feel I'm going a little bit too quickly towards deployment manage, uh, deployment model in a product-related conversation, the reason that I think it's important to recognize this is this actually ends up impacting to a large extent how quickly are you able to change things, how easily or quickly can your customers actually get at them, and things like that. And I'll share a couple of suggestions in the next slide around this. 
Next bit is that um, service SLAs, uptime guarantees are critical. Um, they are, of course, very important in consumer products too, but let's take, in fact, mail or Gmail or email for consumers versus enterprises. If Gmail for consumers was down for a certain amount of time, a lot of us would be upset. But if you actually end up selling it to an organization, typically it comes with a specific SLA, and the org is actually relying on you to make sure that the email service is up for a long amount of time so that they can bet their business, bet running their business on your part. And so these take a whole different dimension and a level of importance as you think about enterprise products. The third is the customer's control over upgrade cycle. And this might be, uh, this actually I can probably best explain with a story. Several years back, I was talking about an enterprise product in a room full of IT architects and execs. And I was talking about, like, hey, here's all the amazing things that we have in the latest version. It's, if you go ahead and just deploy it, it'll have X, Y, Z. Here's the incremental value it'll add for you, and so on and so forth. And what it came about to was, they were like, well, this is great. We are still on the product that's three versions behind, which you released seven years ago. And the reason that's an important thing to process, and this goes back to your point about actually talking to customers and, and users, of course, is there may be many different constraints which come to customers upgrading to enterprise products, which may have things to do with reluctance or encouragement of their own internal departments, budgets, especially if the newer product comes at a different pricing point, supportability, because oftentimes enterprise product, especially when they are in this category, may be managed for a certain number of years, and then they tend to run out of support or get a smaller level of support from the vendor, and things of that nature. But that is a factor of, even if you get something out today, if customers are the ones who are typically setting the cadence of when and how they deploy, it might be a certain amount of time before those features are actually used. Something to bear in mind. The key metrics that you typically tend to think about or focus on in enterprise products. Now, I'll share these for each of the categories. Obviously, many of them do overlap. What I've done is distill which few that I feel are more important or ones that are worth paying a closer attention to for each type of product. So in the enterprise space, the thing that starts mattering is how many deployments you have and what type of deployments are those. Now, there's some products which have just one, I'm just taking an example, one to five specific customers that deploy them, but these are very large deployments. So the company's focus shifts, or the product team's focus shifts to making sure that those large deployments are successful. Then there's many others, but you might find that it's actually deployed by a wider set of customers, but they are like very concentrated in certain geographic regions and whatnot. So having a sense of where's the deployments happening and which type of customers are actually deploying them and watching them as you go month over month, quarter over quarter, is an important thing. The next thing is number of users per customer, or the amount of revenue per customer. It is also an interesting thing to track. To sort of contrast between the third and the fourth one, on the one aspect, you'll probably be charging for your product in a lot of cases and different types of things. One is you might have a fixed access fee, for instance, X dollars per user per month. You might have a flat fee. In some cases, you have licenses or contracts that run one to three years old. There's a variety of different business models. But the key thing is, the third bullet is capturing what is it that you are deriving out of it, out of your product. The latter bullet is also important to keep in mind, is what does it mean for the customer to be actually deploying your product? What is it that is costing them? And you ideally, obviously, want to be increasing your revenue while ensuring it's easy and cost-effective for your customers to continue to use theirs. And there's the specifics of these vary very quickly depending on a specific type of enterprise product, but it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Now, if you think about now this setting of enterprise products and think about specific strategies you can share, here's a few that come to mind. One is, and this is where we can tackle your point around which, like, who's the user, right? So there is a difference typically in enterprise products between who's the decision maker of whether or not your product's actually going to be deployed and who's the actual end user. And end users also may take different roles in the organization based on what type of product you have. But it's an important one to keep in mind because Yes, you do need to make sure that the decision maker, which could be an IT admin, which could be a business vertical owner managing a certain function in the company, and the end users may be everyone who's either in that, or that part of the organization or even beyond that specific organization in that customer setting. Second one is a well-rounded launches matter. And this is a key point to make. In enterprise products, if you just go ahead and get an amazing level of features, which are not that visible to the customers, 
then it's possible that either it does not end up getting deployed as quickly as you were hoping for, or not to the extent that you had in mind. And the best way I can explain this is if you think about, um, let's try and make it a little bit more complete. Say I developed a new type of database product, which had several efficiencies, could handle some new things which other database products couldn't. Now if you think about it, again going back to our theme of putting yourself in the shoes of your customer, how do you think they would approach it or how would they even hear about it? One is they might see some blog posts on your official, your company's official blog, where you might describe, hey, here's all the features. They probably would go to certain conferences occasionally. They probably keep track of industry news via newsletters that they subscribe to. And a lot of the times, they're networking with peers who are in similar roles in other organizations. And then, the first time that they hear about it might be, okay, like this particular company came out with a new database product, cool. Oh, it can do these things, that's fine. Then they start getting a sense of, okay, it is actually starting to get deployed. The ones who have deployed it have this to say, and that's where case studies come. It might be, and the best case studies are not the ones that are very marketing oriented, like of course everyone wants to put their best foot forward, but are actually explaining the real trade offs that go ahead. Like, for instance, hey, this database is amazing. It will go ahead and actually increase your performance by 20%. But when we tried it on our actual production deployment, it increased our database size by 30%. And if you had databases that were over 500 MB in size, then this and this thing happened. So when the actual customer who is about to deploy a database product starts to get a sense of these types of inputs from others who are actually trying it out, that's when it starts becoming a more real consideration for them. Another thing is, if you could now take that database and make it available in a test or a trial version for them to actually try it out, either directly on your company's website, or at conferences and industry events, that's another place where they can go ahead and get their feedback. Now, if you think about it, if you were the person whose job was at the customer side to decide whether or not you migrate your company's database to this new one, would you go ahead and bet your career on this decision without doing your fundamental research? Would you want to be the only one of the 500 database admins in the area that chose to migrate to this while nobody else did? And at the end of the day, things like this, which are not technically the bits that you're shipping or the service that you're making available, but are all the things that go around it, end up having a large influence on how your product is actually received by customers and is a key part of their consideration decision. The next thing that often happens is you actually talk about even proof of concepts that happen at customer sites. So this is one where you don't just want to go ahead and make sure that, you know yes, all the additional documentation is good, if your product is a high touch product, which does require close, working closely and directly with the customers before it's deployed, having a successful POC happen, especially with your larger customers, is often a key consideration. Them coming and hearing about it from sources outside of just your company's official sources by good independent veterans in the industry that they hear about and trust is also a key consideration. So teeing all these things up around the launch is actually quite helpful. The other thing is, it's also important to keep in mind that it's about ongoing usage and not just making the sales decision. So for instance, let's say that you sold your database product in a model where they have now gone ahead and licensed it for three years. Great, you made the sale today, the terms are signed, and the money's gonna come in at whatever cadence you agree to. Now think about it. How does the deployment decision or the reconsideration decision happen for them? Probably like six months to a year before the three years are up, they're gonna start thinking internally well, how useful was this investment? When we think about how are we gonna spend our next year's budget, is it worth or does it make sense to still go ahead and actually license or use this particular database product or shift to a different one? And that's where actual usage matters. So in business models where you're sort of locked in for a certain amount of time, or I shouldn't say locked in, more like there's a periodic expected amount that's coming in, still making sure that it's actively being used remaining in close touch with their customers to help address incremental features they might need and just helping them and delivering that in the product. Not every little feature or little enhancements needs to or should be independently monetized. Going ahead and making sure it's successful on those levels is a key aspect. How do you decide whether you should push for an upgrade before the agreement comes in or should you even try that? How do you decide that as a you know, person making that choice? So when you say upgrade, do you mean so as, like the the customer customer as the customer or as the company? Person? As a company offering that to the customer. Right. That's a good question. And I'll just broaden it slightly and say, so once the product has shipped, especially ones that are typically deployed for a certain number of years, what are some ways you can think about when are you going to go ahead and make incremental things available to the customers? 
and how strongly are you going to push for their adoption before whatever the national cadence is. I think it depends on what type of incremental upgrade is it. These days, unfortunately, there's a lot of like security related issues that are coming to the fore in a variety of products and industries. And so one strategy which a lot of companies follow is if there is something that actually will help increase the security of the product or plug a hole which has now been disclosed, it is something that's typically made available at the next cycle, often monthly batches, or if it was a service, then you go ahead and just upgrade everyone without sort of waiting for you know more formal communications and then let them know what you did do um, is one type of thing that happens. The second is in some cases, what you might do is if solving a specific type of use case. So let's, let's take it with an example, let's always appear that way. So say in my database, I had an issue where for certain types of um, integers, had a performance hit of, let's say, 40%. Now, I have a fix for it. I've gone ahead, worked with my engineering team. We have a way to patch it, to address it. Do you go ahead and actually take it and send it out to all your users? Or do you go ahead and only make it available to the subset that are actually impacted by it? And I think the decision of that would come down to, if you had a way to understand how is your product being used by each of the customers, you might be able to say, you know what? Only 10% of our customers have integers that are this large, which are impacted by this issue. So let's let them know that there's an option and they can use it, but we wait or hold off for most of them. On the other hand, if it actually impacts a substantially larger amount of your customer base, if it was a ship in the box type of product, then you might look to make it available to them, to like your entire audience and sooner. Another thing to keep in mind is, while I'm taking this example for simplicity, the more predominant model in enterprise products, especially if you're gonna go ahead and build something new, in a lot of cases, is actually making it available via a SaaS model or like via cloud deployments, where effectively either you manage or you're able to influence the deployments that your customers are using. And that's a key consideration because in that case, you could judiciously choose to go ahead and deploy and make the upgrades without a lot of machinery, folks needing to be involved, people needing to manually do a lot of steps. And that's a big advantage. The one principle I leave you with is, obviously you want to be cognizant of what are the implications of actually making the upgrade in that case. For instance, if going ahead and fixing this issue impacted a key aspect of your product, in a database product it might be latency, could be the size of the database, and things like that, then you would want to make sure you have the right type of safeguards or guidance in place before you aggressively go ahead and try and just fix it for all your customers. The last thing you'd want is, you're trying to fix this issue, which is probably just hitting performance by a certain amount of time, but you ended up doing it in a manner where the whole deployment had some other notable things, things like that. And the last bit to focus on here is ensuring interoperability with relevant products. Now the reason that this is important is, enterprise products, especially the ones that are going out today or for the last several years, are rarely a fully contained isolated products. Now it's very unlikely that even this database example that I'm describing would be a database that you deploy, and like it's probably useless if it doesn't actually power up another service that is using the database. It is also possible that it might need to interrupt with a variety of other types of products. For instance, some type of a logging product that they might have deployed so that their security teams could get all the key audits and logs in one place some type of access control product they might have deployed. So that if they wanted to say, anytime somebody comes in, they're accessing this database via second factor authentication, it shouldn't be that your database product doesn't actually confirm or doesn't have a way to work with those types of protocols and things like that. So the key thing is, a lot of the times, you may not actually have to go ahead and invest in making code changes to support these scenarios. Some of these, even these two examples that I took, might happen at a layer that is below or like not visible to the layer at which your product is written or coded to, but it's important to be aware that they can happen and try and test for the right types of environments. That also depends on sometimes uh, standards, compliance, and things like that. Yes, very good point. Standards and compliance, especially in areas where the industry is a little bit more involved, evolved, excuse me, you'll find that there is certain protocols, as you're noting, which have been standardized. Whether or not they are officially standardized by a body like W3C, if practically 80% of all the products that are coming out are using it and yours doesn't, then that can also end up coming in the way of making your product be effective. So there's more considerations like this that we can chat about. At this point, if you dig deeper, we'll probably start getting into some more engineering related conversations. So I just wanna bring it back a little bit to the product side. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna ask. Actually, what does bring it up from the nitty gritty that we went into? 
What's a good successful team looks like for a PM to leverage? Because I think you've touched upon customer success manager roles, you've touched upon product engineering, you've touched upon deployment uh, support. And so, uh, so when you actually uh, start a new product or you're managing an existing product, you know, what's, what are your key people you actually depend on uh, to be able to make these decisions, right? Right, no, that's a very good point. It's like product management, like many other disciplines, but especially for PM, if you just have a PM and don't actually have an engineering team that is building the product, you're not going to have a product. I mean, the PM could themselves choose to code if they wanted to for certain smaller products, but typically that's that's a key part is you obviously need an engineering counterpart. But it's not just that, to your point, like in which cases, what type of teams are affected. I think it's honestly a function of, to a large extent, the type of organization that you're building in it. If you're a small, nimble group of people in a startup or a smaller team in a larger company, it's quite likely that one person will have to wear more than one hat. A PM can, in cases, especially if you have like four people, it might be that the PM is also themselves taking on the roles which typically a UX researcher might, in some cases a UX designer might, at least to the level of you know wireframes and things like that. In larger organizations, or if you are in a company that does have a larger product development unit and you do have these roles available, the way that I, I think it typically happens is you think about the type of product. So I'm gonna assume that you have UX researchers, customer support, sales, engineering, there to front end, back end, UX designers, and various roles available. I think the key thing is you want to make sure what type of product is it, what type of a visible surface area is it gonna have for customers. In many cases, you may then decide that, for instance, if it's a UI-oriented product or one that has a large UI surface, you obviously will want to work closely with a UI or a UX designer. I think a more practical way to sort of evolve the question is probably do have a UX designer and they're supposed to help out with 10 different products in the company. How and when do you make sure you work with them to get attention to your product? Versus like, hey, maybe there's another product that is better worthy of their direct time. And one way to think about it is see how granular of an ask you wish to make on them. And then you might decide that, hey, if you're actually crunch on resources, here's the thing that we're trying to do. Here's why or where we believe a UX designer can help. And ideally, we'd love an engagement, which is like this amount of time or for a sustained period. But if you're actually short on time, then we work with them to go ahead and have a few reviews, like maybe a review of wireframes, get their feedback, go ahead and make some tweaks, come back and get their feedback on the next round, and so on. It's another model. To round off your question, the other roles that come into play, um, since we're talking about enterprise products, a lot of the times, the folks in your professional services organization are the ones who are customer engineers, like working closely with the customers, are key allies, and it does help, does make a lot of sense to partner with them proactively, especially when you're in the earlier stages of trying to fine tune your product and make sure it lands well and can meet needs. Um, any other roles? Did that answer your question? Yeah, like I, I actually, I'm an IT director at ADI, right? So I, uh, I work with vendors, and typically my contact has two types of people. One is maybe three, the sales guy, is <laughs> always trying to sell me uh, support. I love. They, I, I feel they are actually better than the PMs at times because they're connected with my problems hardly. You know, I almost the PM calls me, I tell them to go back to the support because they have it all. <laughs> you know. And so, uh, so now if I go into a PM role at a software company, right? What's what's interesting for me is what's my sphere of influence? You know, whom should I be betting my hat on, right? To make good decisions because if I take wrong signals from the sales guy, for example, you know, uh, that he thinks he can get more money if the customer we go to shop, right? That's just the wrong way to go about it, right? And so, what do you, uh, you know, at Google or in general PM? If there's a product steering committee, right? Who are the core members that decide major, minor uh, roadmaps? All right. So I think I, I see like two parts of that question. One is in general for partnering, who do you partner with? And second is when it comes to actually making product decisions, what are good and effective strategies? Um, I think we covered most of the first part earlier. Just to recap, it's a variety of different disciplines based on that product and what stage the product is at. You can decide what makes most sense. Honestly, it's often also a function of the other person's time. But as a PM, it's, I believe the onus is on you that if you felt, for instance, 
you did need the attention of a full-time UX designer for your product, but for not getting it, then obviously raising visibility and having the right conversations is something which you would champion. To your other part about what are effective ways to actually make decisions on product strategy, um, I think let's take another example of like a sort of a larger organization which has few key products and it's important to make sure you're building the right things in. So in these cases, you might find that the decision committees effectively are much larger. Um, I believe it's still useful to have, so just to round that off, you probably have obviously someone from the product management side, somebody from engineering, the right voices from the field organization, which depending on the org structure, could be some or all of sales, sales ops, uh, support, customer engineers, Folks who are actually working with customers to deploy them, sometimes called as solutions or field engineers in some companies, and some representation of these. The one way that you obviously don't want to you know, get tied into a decision by committee which slows everything down is you can obviously have the right type of reviews, but you go ahead and take your five largest thing that you're gonna go to or thinking of doing and get that feedback early. One thing you can also do, which especially since we're on enterprise products is consulting your largest customers, or going ahead and actually seeing if they're willing to try out a couple of things that you're thinking of in their specific uh, deployment, and seeing what were the results of those early deployments. Um, in other cases, what you can find, and happens even in larger companies, that happen a lot in smaller organizations with fewer PMs, is you might find that for certain areas of the product, the core team, which is the PM and their engineering counterpart, or engineering lead, depending on how things are structured, themselves go ahead and start making a lot of these decisions, especially when you're an experimental research. So if you had a type of product where you could go ahead and make a change, put up an experiment, see the A-B test results of that, and then make a decision, assuming the change wasn't that drastic, you can probably go ahead and push that deeper into your organizations and let team make the right type of decisions. Team can decide to come up and get feedback early for like a few other things that they're thinking of, for instance, to help prioritize, hey, here's six ideas we have, which of these are probably going to be the most impactful to our customers? Versus, here's three different enhancements we're thinking of that are somewhat more creative enhancements. What I'm describing typically might happen more in a consumer product, where you decide, for instance, even small things like changing the type of logo that you have that somebody might need to click on or whatnot could end up having a bigger difference. You might choose to experiment more and then analyze the experiment results to decide which ones you actually take in production. All right, so let's move from enterprise products to the next category, which is consumer products. Um, these are the ones where, again, just to try and have a simple way of looking at them, I believe they fall in two buckets. One is that a lot of them are actually there in order to entertain their users, which may be that you effectively have, let's say, you're making a game, simple case, or you go ahead and invest in a YouTube or, uh, sorry, YouTube videos or some podcasts, and the idea is, at the end of the day, you're doing this in order to delight your users, to entertain them, and it's a very different type of product than one where you are actually still going out there to address a specific problem. And sort of one way to think about them is, at the end of the day, is it more like a toothbrush or is it more like a television set? And I mean, maybe elaborate on that with an example. Most of us, hopefully brush at least once a day, probably more often, or my dentist says we should more often, right? And then we use a toothbrush. As so you go ahead, use the toothbrush, you're done. Now there's certain bells and whistles you can have. Like I think the last one that I got had some fancy parts where like some of the toothbrush was rotating and apparently it's you know giving me cleaner teeth and whatnot. But besides a few tweaks like this, by and large, they exist to solve a simple purpose, which is to keep my teeth clean. But if you think about a television set, it solves a very different need where I'm sitting down in front of the TV set, maybe to binge watch the last season of the House of Cards, seeing more episodes than I should, because it's late and I should you know, catch it on my sleep. But that does happen. You go there to be entertained, to be delighted. You're playing a game, and you probably want to be immersed in it for half an hour, an hour or longer. And here, the type of product is trying to do something very different than actually helping solve a problem. There's probably products that start transgressing the two boundaries, and it's hard to put them in one bucket or the other. But it's very, I feel like, effective, at least as like trying to do an initial assessment of which type of product is it. Maybe take an example and that helps explain the point. So let's think about messaging. To go back many years, there was this need that, yes, we have mobile phones. We could pick up the phone and call each other, but a lot of the time, it's not practical to actually talk to the other person, or you don't want to be calling them for every little thing. 
And then text messages were the simple product that helped meet the need. But then if you think about it, they had certain problems. One, you typically could send only one-to-one, -one, though some phones had multi-send feature. It had a certain amount of cost to send each one. There were problems or complications when you try to send it internationally. In the US, a lot of users may have had their SMS plans turned off and you wouldn't know before you texted them. And then you started looking at certain types of um, other applications emerged. So, and one more problem was they could only do text up to a certain number of characters. So then somebody came up with the idea of a MMS. And yes, that could send media, but then not all phones could support it. And there were some other challenges around carrier interop and whatnot. Fast forward a little bit more, and then that's how we ended up in the world of text messaging apps. Most of you probably use some form of either WhatsApp, WeChat, or one of the other popular chat applications. And now if you think about it, it's evolved to a point where you're able to go ahead and send messages individually in groups of folks, and you're able to send rich media, you're also able to send videos, which a lot of the other formats that I spoke about could not do. But if you take a step back and think about it, they are essentially trying to solve the same type of problem, is how do you, take, how do you make messaging easier in a variety of different contexts and applications. If you then think about, you know, I won't go through such an elaborate example, but you can quickly play out in your mind how things like videos on the internet evolve, or how gaming applications evolve. And at the end of the day, starting to think about which type of product you are interested in building is the key dimension that helps make a lot of other decisions or factors simpler. The second thing is, in the consumer space, these days there's a lot of things that are vying for our attention. So there was this phase, for those of you who follow the sort of apps ecosystem, a few years after the iPhone announcement and other OSs emerging, mobile applications were suddenly very exciting. A lot of companies, a lot of products coming out, everyone's saying, we even hear the expression, there's an app for that. But the problem that happens is, after a certain amount of time, you start losing track of which apps did you even install on your phone. When did you last use it? And then there was another issue. When we start, go ahead and start finding notifications. Great, except the notifications started getting too many, and it started getting inundated. And so at the end of the day, for consumer products, it is tricky to, solve, to make things a daily habit unless you're solving a very core problem with a very clear premise. And if you think about it, there is still a somewhat smaller set of things that you actually want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So thinking about when and how often would a user want to actually use your product, once it's in steady state, it's been out deployed, it's been a certain amount of days since they installed it, and how is it that you help make it valuable or have the right type of triggers or motivating factors for them to come back in and use it is another key aspect that comes into play in consumer products. Because otherwise, yes, you can go ahead and get a certain milestone in your app store of you know, 10,000 downloads, 100,000, but at the end of the day, a lot of those installs are often forgotten, or even if they're there, the user knows they're not coming into it as, as often. So the thing that becomes interesting is thinking about what type of demographics do you target, and maybe the product that you build, even if it's a consumer product, is not of interest to everybody. It's like, yes, there's messaging matters to almost everyone, there's probably only so many messaging apps that are going to end up gaining traction. But there might be a different type of need you solve, which applies to a specific segment of the users, and that could be a daily habit for that subset of folks. For instance, for folks who have large commute times, having a podcast app and actually using it on a day-to-day -day basis, even if that's only, say, 15% of all consumer users, is still a pretty large base, and you could choose to target that. So starting to think about who you're targeting your app to or your consumer product to can be a key consideration. What if that base is not large? You, you, you have an amazing, let's say you're very passionate about this product and as you mentioned, and in this case, I think even in this area, five mile commute is a long, long time usage, right? But if you live somewhere where you know, your demographic base is very tiny and you really, you really like that product, would you go for volume or do you go for what you like? What do you, what do you? It's How do you decide? We're probably not going to like my answer, because my answer is it depends. It really depends a lot on what specific thing are you trying to do. Um, if you're, and what your sort of goals are for like that product. Are you trying to go ahead and grow your expanded user base? And really trying to get, well this is actually a good segue to start uh, talking about metrics in a minute. But are you trying to really grow your user base? Or are you trying to very deeply meet the need of a certain set of users? Is a key consideration. Other aspects that might matter is, 
is it just the number of users? Is it also the amount of time that they're spending in the app? Now, especially if you're an entertainment product, maybe you're fine if there's like you know, a smaller set of users, but they tend to spend 30 minutes, 60 minutes in your app more than once a week. That might be a very good state to be in. The other thing is, even when you think about consumer products, they may actually be tied into another ecosystem that's not on the smartphone. A lot of apps, for instance, uh, let's take an example. Your banking app. Yes, you ideally love for your users to be able to get to their bank accounts, to bother checks from their phone. But if the rest of the time they're not actually coming into the mobile app but are doing their banking through the website or other mechanisms, that is also probably okay. So factoring in what type of product, what are you trying to go after, is what will dictate or inform your goals. And that's why I say it really depends on the specifics. And it can change pretty quickly uh, from one type of product. So let's talk a little bit about metrics next. Um, what type of things come into play? And there's obviously a variety of different metrics. Some of those become more relevant on certain types of products or one form factor, like web versus mobile app. But there's a few common things. So let's think about it. One is this category of acquisition metrics. And so one way to think about it, and I have this, I don't have the visual on the slide, but somebody shared a very nice visual with me once. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the marketing funnel concept. I'm seeing several heads not great. So that's one way to think about it, is how many users am I starting to acquire or starting to pay attention to even what I'm doing? So let's, let's try and define that. The moment somebody installs your app and opens it for the first time, let's call that a simple acquisition metric. So then what you might track is number of users who came into the app. The next is activation. I came into the app, but let's say I actually went ahead and completed the sign-up flow. So at that point, I went there and I said, all right, I'm willing to be an ongoing user. So you sort of activated them. Then if you think about it, the third category is retention. Is after you ended up at this date, at this date, how many of them are coming back to your app seven days after they installed it, 30 days after they installed it? Could be good activation metrics. Another one could be, especially one that's more common on the web, but definitely can apply to the app, is daily active users, seven day active users, monthly active users. And in fact, these metrics are so important where if you take, for instance, Facebook, I haven't checked their last couple of quarters, but in their initial earnings calls, they were actually talking about, they probably still do, the number of daily and monthly active users they have. And that's a metric that's watched closely by even like Wall Street investors and things. So some of these are of interest outside, but for you as a product manager, these are great metrics to know whether or not your product is succeeding. The last category is engagement, and this is also an interesting one, where you think about Again, it might be best explained with an example. Um, so let's say, actually let's do an agnostic one and then I'll take an example. So something like number of sessions and average time per session are interesting metrics to track. Since we're talking about Facebook for a minute, in their case, yes, it probably follows that if a user is actually spending more time on the news feed, checking out what's happening with their friends or other pages they like, it's a good thing. So it's generally a good metric to track. If it started falling, by some notable amount, there probably be a lot of teams inside Facebook or their product managers, engineering teams, whoever, who pay attention to that and then think about what are the implications of that trend. Do they, do they want to try and do other things to try and change it? For instance, changing how they lay out the news feed, changing how often are they sending you the reminder emails. I got an interesting one today saying, such and such person commented or liked on such and such other person's post. And like, I mean, that's an example of, depending on how close do you feel about the other person, you might want to click on straight up here, maybe why am I getting this notification? But not to pick on the notification, the idea is by using mechanisms like this, you can try and influence the engagement rate that you're seeing in your particular product. There's various kinds of metrics. Um, there's, of course, much more literature in this that there's many good articles and stuff. If some of you want to ask offline, I can try and share some resources. But the idea is being careful about which type of metrics you track and tracking a good set of metrics is especially important for consumer products because in consumer products, typically, it's actually harder to spend time directly, and I shouldn't say that for across the board, but in many cases, with your end users. Or you're, you may not be able to go as deep. You might not be able to sit next to them. You might be able to watch a few, but Facebook can't spend like, you know, 100,000, can't afford to spend the time to watch 100,000 users watch their news feeds every day or like every month. So this is where watching these metrics and trying to understand and work with trends or changes in the metrics is an important thing. Another thing though I do want to caution is if you start looking at metrics, you probably obviously want to do a few that you quickly start tracking. But you probably want to take the time to have either yourselves or somebody in your team 
spending energies to understand the trends that you see. For instance, let me take a simple example. If you see monthly active users suddenly drop off by 30%, right? something's not good. But then if you try to root cause it, is it so that you've slowed down the rate of acquiring new users? Or is it so that that's constant, but for some reason these users have stopped coming in? Just this next level diagnosis might end up impacting what decisions you choose to make to try and react to them. If it's so that we just are, we typically acquire 1,000 new customers, uh, users each month, that rate has slowed down to 200, and typically like some percentage of them convert and become monthly active users, okay, then maybe the attention, where we need to pay attention is to start getting the word about our app. Or if it is so that it's the same users that are coming in, uh, that are coming in net new, but have just stopped using the app that often, then you might choose to do a different set of things, it's investigate what's happening. Then you might go and say, okay, let's look at, let me take a website example where it may be simpler, let me look at the last visited URL. So if your website has like 50 different pages, what's the page where we are losing the users the most? Compare that with two weeks back or a month back and try and analyze the time. So as soon as you start watching just a few of these metrics, especially if you're trying to root cause, probably need to go a few levels deep and start doing this type of analysis. I don't cover them in the rest of the deck, but just as an example, Google Analytics is one product that does it. Um, this type of thing. There's obviously many others in the industry which are one you want to use. So what if you make a new product or you're testing something new, you see a drop anyway, you anticipate a little bit before the, the, your customer sees the new interface, adjust to it. How do you diagnose that and say, okay, you know what, it's been too long that they haven't, my results haven't gone up. So because, you, you know, sometimes it drops because you expect it, you, you, you know, people don't like change, but sometimes you force them to do it and how do you decide where to go from there? Right, right. So I think one thing is, um, for you in drastic, especially if you have a very popular website such as Google or like MSN.com or Wall Street Journal or whatnot, something where it really matters a lot, what you typically do is you go ahead and always experiment first. And then you can experiment by saying, this is a change that we want to make. We're going to only send it to a small subset of our user base, right? Say 0.02%, depending on how many, or 1%, depending on how many users the site was getting. And then you actually spend a lot of time analyzing the results of the experiment. And if the experiment was inconclusive, you can always run it a different way. For instance, targeting a different demographic, run, choosing to run it at a different time of day and whatnot. But there's these types of things which you can do and then make the decision. Does that answer the yeah, question? Yeah, it gives me better. Okay. How do you go ahead and you know, just some sharing some suggestions on building effective and useful consumer products? Um, very important to define the goal of your product clearly. Like going back to that previous slide, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? And then, because what can sometimes happen is after you launch, especially if you start tracking metrics, if you're not careful, for instance, let me share with an example. Let's say I started tracking page views per day. Pretty simple, yes, how many PVs am I getting? The thing is, I can get page views probably one of two ways. One is I could go ahead and have well thought out articles and like the user takes the time to read it. Or I could go ahead and do uh, one that maybe the 10 richest people in California. And like as everybody does next, 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 there are some standards set by IAB and actually IAB sets the ones for ads, but there are some standards on what counts as a page view. And if you flip through something like this five times, it might count as five page views. So for a while, you could get a metric high that, oh, this metric's amazing, everything's going great but you lost focus on what was the core value you were trying to solve. So you were trying to give good advice around health, let's say, to my user base. And so there's different metrics you can track to get around this specific case. It's called core page views versus page views. But the larger point is being mindful and keeping track of which specific problem you're trying to solve, and then focusing on the right metrics will actually help you keep tabs on your product as it goes. A couple other things to share is um, we spoke some about target demographics. But it's actually interesting to think about it is, a lot of times when we think about demographics, we might only think of age or geographies. Like, hey, it's people in a specific user base, excuse me, specific age group, or it's people in this geographic region versus the other, um, gender, like a few other things. But the interesting thing is, if you start paying attention to this, and I want to combine it a little bit with the last bullet point, here's an interesting exercise to try, is to try to understand who are your fans. So if you have a consumer app or a consumer website, 
and then you start trying to get a sense of which type of users tends to spend a lot of time. What you might find is there is a specific demographic, which may be a combination of these factors, which is actually responsible for, say, 30% of all your paid users. And then you check how many of them there are. And then you try and make active efforts to try and grow that type of demographic. And that might be the thing that actually moves the needle in terms of your consumer apps and option. So that's another interesting way to think about consumer apps. How do you stay relevant in consumer apps? And I know, like, products like Blackberry, Tom, so, uh, these are some very large products which uh, ended up, yes, at some point of time, starting to lose traction. How do you say relevant? I think one is obviously watching the metrics, but I think your question is in a different direction. Is trying to keep sense of what else is happening in the industry. Like, for example, you mentioned BlackBerry. There were some very large trends in the smartphone industry, which were clearer, which, again, I don't follow them too closely, so I don't want to conjecture here, but potentially failing to adapt to some of those trends in a timely manner is what caused uh, their slowdown. In other cases, it might be that there's a different sort of app or a different type of website, which is what users are gravitating towards, which has some network effects. For instance, one of the reasons why I personally don't use WeChat as much is I don't have that many friends or people who I know who are on WeChat. In my case, a lot more of them are on WhatsApp. But if you talk about, let's say, a uh, user in China, the exact opposite may be true. They might have almost everyone they do on WeChat, and so when a new person comes along, they might go ahead and start off there. So there can be a variety of different things. That the last category that we'll talk about is business products. And so to contrast this, I think, with the enterprise products which we covered first, the one thing to think about it is their key function is that they help advance key business functions. And that is an interesting factor to keep in mind is at the end of the day, if for instance you are a finance or an accounting product, what are some things you're trying to solve? You're trying to make sure you provide the right level of tracking to your company. You have the right things in place to be able to do tax uh, calculations at the end of the year. And you have the right type of reports that are available inside the company. So this is a type of key aspect of the business part. Uh, the other thing which you alluded to, I think, becomes acute here in different ways is there's different personas. So you have some executives. You may have people in sales ops. You may have people in IT. You also have your end users, which are actually interesting pieces to cater to. Integration with custom processes and tools is another key aspect in business products. And then over time, the focus shifts from going ahead and just having a basic thing in place to being able to provide the right type of system smart. So let me take an example. Let's talk about a CRM product. A basic feature might be you go ahead and indicate, here's all the customers, or here's all the deals we have in play. Here's their status. And then some way for them to be able to track their activities. And you probably go ahead and spend time on doing something like this if you were building a CRM product from scratch today. But once you have solved a lot of these core use cases um, or features, what you might then arrive at is, all right, now how do I go ahead and actually start having the right things be available in their workflows before they actually, the user realizes they even need it? And that's where it's very impactful. For instance, the moment that I'm getting off a call, or just gonna imagine something here, is uh, I get off a call and I'm starting to make some notes, and typically at this point, I tend to send an email to my team sharing an update. Now if the system was able to understand that there's something like this happening and is able to have features, that start making this available. Another type of smart could be you're starting to provide more analysis for the user while they're in the app so that they have a better sense of, okay, this is the revenue that came in, here's the trend we are seeing, here's how it varies or not with what we're seeing in other parts of the sales org. So these types of things are pretty powerful value apps that can come into business products. Key metrics to keep in mind are uh, product reach, the total amount of revenue, for instance, again, taking our CRM example, what's the total amount of sales that are happening through the app? Through the app, What's the number of deals that we've had? How are users engaging? And what's their productivity? That's another very key aspect in business software is, at the end of the day, if you're helping, obviously, meet the needs of the organization for which you build the product, but are also able to help users be efficient and productive, going back to our toothbrush analogy, like be able to do that in a business setting where it, they can go and do their thing and get out and it takes them a small amount of time versus other products, that can be an interesting advantage. Um, some strategies to try is understand the decision makers and functional roles. We covered some of this earlier, so I won't go over it again. Proactively discuss the right metrics and expectations. Um, 
this is an interesting one to talk about is especially in business settings and sometimes in enterprise software settings which specific metric are important it's good to have that conversation up front in cases where you have a high touch engagement model with the customers because it might be that for instance you were very focused on trying to make the whole experience be very fast whereas what they wanted was more coverage and then you focus on a thing that was different than your user base was actually interested in. Um, make an ROI argument and demonstrate measurable impact and prioritizing keeping your end users happy. Because at the end of the day, there's a certain set of decision makers, but then there's a certain set of users who are actually building the product for. And as a PM, you are their first and foremost advocate. So go ahead and pause here. Uh, these are all the key try slides we have. Now, it's just up to you. We can go and do one of two things. We can probably open it up for Q&A. And if you wanted to, we could take a couple of product examples and actually try things out. I'm going to break into Q&A and see if there's any questions. Please. How do you do experimentation uh, in enterprise products, which are long uh, product uh, rollout cycles? Uh, it's an interesting question. I spoke about experimentation in consumer products, but how do you go ahead and do it in enterprise? Depending on the type of enterprise product it is, if it is one where you have a high touch engagement with uh, your customers, and I keep saying high touch engagement just to explain that uh, for most enterprise products, you probably have some customers who you have a relationship with where they are happy to have you come and collaborate with them, either directly at their sites or at conferences or other mechanisms. And there's probably a larger set of customers who yes, are using your products, but you are not having that deep of an engagement with them. So in cases uh, to experiment, if there was a few, if there were a few customers that were interested in trying out a specific aspect, one is you can gauge interest. Honestly, a lot of the times, if what you're building will help solve that customer's needs, they will be happy to try it out, or at least in like a limited test setting. That's one way to experiment. Try and integrate it with their, on their actual deployment. If you were doing it via the SaaS model or by the cloud deployment model, which is effectively where you control, you could still do an experimentation in an enterprise setting by, for instance, changing something about going back to our database analogy for just two percent of your users, noticing what happened before and after. Of course, it's a, if it's a big change, you probably want to let them know. If it's something minor within SLAs, you could still do it and see what you get and then decide whether you make that available more broadly. What kind of tricks that you for like habit formation for new customers or old customers. In which type of product? In general or uh, in general? Like what kind of techniques that you see? Or uh, do you see any specific difference in enterprise versus something or? Yeah. So how do you sort of go in and have um, habit formation? One is especially if it's a frequent need type of a product. Um, then you go ahead and see if you are actually solving or focusing on the right user need. And are you continue to track and see if there's ways that you can do it better? Start noticing if you see users are falling off and are starting to go on the other side. We discuss an example, like try and analyze, diagnose that. Um, on the positive side, to try and accentuate, you can always try out different things. For instance, if one of the metrics you chose to focus on was um, average session length, right? Like how much time does somebody spend in your app or a website? And then you can explore, for instance, by experimenting with a different type of content that you might make available to them or some different UI changes if that helps improve it. But at the end of the day it is, and I think one part of that comes down to just innovating and experimenting and the other part comes down to doing the right type of metrics analysis. There's probably as general an answer there. Because you mentioned that you work on activity. Is there like a specific example you could talk us through about what you thought of this feature and how you would like, you know, sort of check your hypothesis and actually went about tweeting it, like something specific? Uh, I think like given that that's a product from an employer that I worked on previously, maybe I like can't take that specific example. Um, but in general, maybe offline we can chat about some general industry use cases where that happened and how customers and companies stumbled upon it. Can you shed on something on the tools that you found very useful uh, as a PM on a day-to-day -day basis? Tools, yeah. Tools can take a you know wide, wide variety of shapes. Some that I personally found useful. Um, let's see. One is obviously various kinds of trackers could be 
Excel sheets, Google sheets, whatever you do prefer, going ahead and using some ways to, to structure some of the fields so you don't always have free flowing text. It's a great way to organize. Uh, some more interesting ones is when you go ahead and talk about, and there's several, so I'm not saying these are the best, but just the ones that I happen to try. Uh, uh, for things like UI mocks, there's a tool called Balsamic, uh, which is something you can experiment with. I experimented with that one time, that was useful. Uh, another was in PowerPoint or Google Sheets itself, like if you're doing UI prototyping, another way could be to go ahead and, for instance, draw out your, let's imagine you're about to build a mobile app, right? Go ahead and draw out the dimensions of a mobile phone and then have certain templates be available below and then you make that the slide background and then you try and drag and drop things. So these are some ways just especially when you don't have a UX designer or you don't have as much of them as you would like, you can experiment with. Um, then there is other types of more formal tools around experimentation. Um, various frameworks, that depends a lot on what type of build and deployment system your company uses. Uh, but as a PM, I have typically not been involved in setting them up, but uh, after they are installed, working with whoever is running the experiments to see the experiments being run and then analyzing the results.